item B, which is a uh, resolution to accept the, uh, the state bond, bond funding for uh, assistance with uh, the purchase of St. Bridget's. And uh, I was, Matt, uh, would you like to offer some background on that? Yes, good morning, everyone. Matt Hart, town manager. I'd be happy to lead off and then through you, Mr. Chairman, turn to Ms. Rubino Turco to Helen to, uh, to add detail. I think every, as everybody at the meeting today knows, uh, we're very, very excited that we're receiving a state grant of uh, $2.5 million towards our $3 million purchase of the former St. Bridget School. I really want to thank the members of our delegation, Representative Farrar in particular, uh, for helping to push this forward at uh, at their state level and at the state level. So certainly the uh, the receipt of, of this funding will allow us to repurpose uh, two two and a half million dollars that we had earmarked in the CIP for this project. You know, you council will have the be able to make the decision in terms of how you want to repurpose that. But it certainly might make sense to allocate it towards future steps related related to this project. We will need to sign execute a grant assistance agreement with the state. That's all standard. We'll need a council resolution. And then through you, Mr. Sweeney, I would turn to Helen to add a, add a little detail to my remarks. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you, Helen Rubino Turco, Director of Leisure Services and Social Services. Um, as Matt said, <clears throat> we uh, are creating a resolution to accept the state bond funding. Um, this will be presented for you prior to the September 14th meeting. Um, we're fulfilling the required paperwork for this state bond commission. It's coming to us through DECD as an Urban Act grant. And uh, it requires the town to have a resolution, but it, that resolution needs to have specific language that DECD requires to have um, for us to proceed with our, um, our the grant. Um, there's other paperwork that we are busy filling out um, as well in, pre in preparation for that. Um, and then in terms of the timeline for um, the purchase, um, Corporation Council um, has, updated us yesterday that um, that we're still aiming to close at the end of August. Um, she's continuing to draft review and approve the deed and the related um, title documents. And we're also working um, on trying to uh, address some encroachment on a couple of properties that are adjacent to the property to the Mayflower address. Um, and if that looks like they're going to comply, then, you know, that might um, we might give them a little bit more time to to um, move um, their sheds. Um, so we're still in that same time frame. Hopefully, um, by the end of August, um, we're also hoping that that goes forward quickly because um, we have a food share distribution currently at um, Faxon Library, and Faxon needs to resume its fall hours. So we want to shift the fat the food share distribution to the Mayflower location, but we can't do that until we own it. Um, and then next steps after that, of course, will be um, we are in the process of developing some guidelines to advise you on the establishment of a building committee. Um, and this committee, of course, would um, kind of advise on on the overall mission, on the, overall. the, the um, development, the community outreach, the design, that kind of thing. So um, Matt has more information on that. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Sweeney. Thank you, Ms. Rubino Turco, Helen, for uh, for your good explanation there. Just to add on to the last point that Helen was describing, we will be proposing to the committee uh, most likely next month a uh, proposed format or outline, if you will, to establish an advisory committee to the council, to the administration. You know, what we're contemplating here is that this would be a committee 
of key stakeholders, you know, representatives, for example, from the library board, uh, from our various parks and recreation advisory committees, uh, C senior center advisory committee, et cetera. A, a good broad cross section of stakeholders, as well as representatives from the community at large who would advise us, work with us during the program development and then the design stages. So advisory to the council, advisory to the administration with respect to the project itself. This is a model that other communities around the state have uh, have successfully employed. You know, we think we think it could work well here, but uh, you know that that will be your decision. We just want to provide you with some options for your consideration. That's that's great. Um, I think that's an excellent way to go forward, and um, I'm glad that we're doing. I'm just very excited about this whole. Uh, thing moving forward in the, in the fashion that it has and, and applaud the staff and, and especially the mayor. Um, I know that uh, she had a lot of conversations directly with the governor about how the importance of this and, and really excited about seeing this move forward and what, what this can do uh, to kind of transform our, um, you know, human and community services here in, in town. So very excited about that. And um, and just just re really proud of the staff for the work that you guys did to turn this around and really act on it. It's, it's really commendable during all all of what is going on uh, in the world. Uh, you guys also were able to focus on this. I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, so uh, that being said, um, uh, you know, I think we can move forward uh we don't have to take a, a a motion on this right matt this is just to pass through here right um but uh um so we'll move on to uh, option b right i uh, mean i'm correct in that we don't have to adopt it for the resolution here right that that is correct Matt our town manager we'll be bringing this we'll be bringing this directly to the council once we have the resolution and the documents from the state <clears throat> okay thank you thank you for that um so um, on to item C. Um, um, one I, before we get to item C, I, I haven't had an opportunity to address all of the amazing work that Helen you've been doing this summer. Um, I again, I think I've said this personally. I'm my, our family is personally uh, very happy with the town's leisure services. Where we will restart at Busy Bee next week. Um, but just just last night, um, I was with a friend who lives out of town. Uh, and sends their kids to some of our programming and just couldn't speak higher about the programming that we have. I've heard from numerous residents about uh, the you know, uh, FC of, of the programs um, and just want to give you kind of your flowers, Helen, while, while you have them here. I think it's really commendable that what we've done um, during the pandemic um, and obviously you know, this continuation of it. Um, the staff has been amazing. Everyone is wearing, you know, masks, very prepared, very courtesy, courtesy, uh, uh, courtesy to all of the, the parents that are coming. You have a great operation. Uh, and I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that because um, I think there are a lot of communities that uh, would wish to have the programming that we have and run it as well as we do. And, I think the other thing that we commented on is the fact that you've been able to, uh, you know, uh, attract and um, retain counselors in a, in a time where I think that's really difficult to do. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a great, uh, welcoming, diverse group of folks that I've seen all over the town. And I just wanted to, 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 to say that um, here, because I think that's what, what this this committee is all about looking at that and, and, and thinking about ways to get better. But I just, you know, when you're doing something right, you should, you know, you should acknowledge that. And I just wanted to do that. Um, and then I guess we'll move on to item C with scholarship. So, um, item C came to us because it occurred from a, a, a few folks of just kind of wanting to better understand this, our scholarship program. Uh, uh, both the 
uh, town manager and uh, and Helen both met with uh, Mayor Cantor and I early on when we were talking about how we were going to use some of the federal dollars, um, and uh, we were told about our, our our current scholarship program and the effectiveness of that, and kind of just wanted to hear uh, how it's gone this summer, the utilization of it. Um, and if there's a way that we can improve the programming and or um, application process, um, but want to better understand it and, and hear from you, Helen. So um, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Liam. Uh, Helen Rubino Turco again. Um, so this is actually kind of falls under my uh, leisure services staff report. So, but uh, I, I'll have this as my first item just to um, carry forward. The um, scholarship fund in leisure services has existed for decades, but it's um, sometimes difficult to raise money for it. Um, so we haven't ever really publicized it other than announcing in our brochures or in our literature that we have a scholarship fund available. Um, with an influx of um, significant, significant funding, um, we have allocated um, this this funding to last for a number of years, so up to four years. Um, but we also double, uh, increased our um, publicity of of the program. So we've written articles, we've got, um, faced it, Facebook posts, we've put it on our website, etc. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, we went back and counted. Um, obviously, over the years, it goes up and down um, depending on on um, need or or word of mouth. But in the eighteen nineteen year, so basically the summer of of um, twenty eighteen, and uh, all the way till June of twenty nineteen, we had fifty five individuals uh, request. Um, uh, a scholarship for 63 programs, to a value of about $7,500. The following year, 1920, we dropped down to 38 um, requests and for 39 programs, and it was about 40, 4,900. This year, um, you know, we began the scholarship fund a little late in our in our year. Um, obviously, the funding wasn't in place until. June, but we went back to anyone that had registered for a summer program to provide them with um, the full um, scholarship. And that again is a 75% scholarship. So they pay 25%. And we also doubled the amount of programs and weeks that they could participate. So we included um, last year, obviously all of last year, we didn't have a lot of programs. We had some programs last summer that did um, uh, take advantage of, of scholarships um, because we did have a couple of camps running, as you know. Um, but we also included the the programs for this summer, just so to give you kind of a full, robust view of what um, the value of what the scholarship has done this year so far. And it's over 16,000. Um, we've had 47 requests for 67 programs. Um, we're really pleased with um, our ability to help our community and to make our programs more accessible, particularly for people, for families that are um, feeling um, uh, financial distress due to, to COVID, due to the pandemic. So we anticipate that this funding will be able to be in place for up to four years, um, that we can monitor it and stretch it out as needed. Um, but we're very pleased with um, our ability to um, to meet these needs, and we're very grateful to the town council for having the foresight to um, to to fund this scholarship fund in a meaningful way. Um, years ago, leisure services used to raise money for the scholarship fund, but we sort of um, shifted our focus to the town that cares when that fund became a little bit more prominent, and that was about in in about. 2006, 2007. Um, that was when, you know, particularly um, just prior to the to the um, to, uh, economic depressions that we we had in the late um, 2000s, um, in the two aughts, you know, the 2009, 2010 around there. So um, we really shifted our focus to that that fund, um, but we still had the leisure services fund all along. This is really going to help us. 
Did you have any questions about the scholarship fund? Yeah, so I, I guess I, I wasn't clear on that. So this this year, this summer, we are at 47 scholarships, is that correct? Currently, we're at 47 scholarships for 67 programs. So some kids are, are um, getting multiple weeks uh, already. So we, we used to limit it to two programs. Now it's four four weeks of a program so it's and then they can also apply in the fall and winter so we will see um, our 2021 22 budget will include the the almost 4800 in scholarships that has happened since July 1 but it'll it'll take us through the entire year and then into all of the programs for next year many people register for summer camp in May April May June so that's all counted in the in the current year in the 20 in the number that I gave you 16,000. Oh, so $16,000 of usage of the scholarship what, and what is in the fund right now? Um, 90,000 minus 16. <laughs> okay. And, and, and so can you I just want to know what why do we limit uh, the the amount like a, a individual can utilize the scholarship do you mean time-wise number of programs so really this is a work in progress but we want to make sure that the fund stays solvent for a number of years we didn't want to blow our wad all in one year all and have it run out in two or three years we wanted to make sure that this was something that would carry us through for up to four years it doesn't sound like we've come anywhere close to that. Well, we're only in July. Well, so last year we anticipate it would probably be more like in the 20 range by the time the year is up. By the end of this year? Yes, by the end of. Yeah, so last year, as you know, we hardly had any camps last summer. So the number that right. you're seeing is really for this summer. It doesn't include last summer. The, when I give you a report in a year from now, it's going to include all of this summer plus all of next summer for most of next summer because most people apply in April, May, and June for the summer program. So this calendar year, this fiscal year, 21, 22, will probably be up around 2025. That's what I anticipate. And then, and then, and then for the on the budget side. What 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 does the council annually contribute to this fund? Nothing. Or what is the budget? Nothing. No, okay. it's it's fu it's funded by things like, um, uh, well, we used to use uh, proceeds from the um, celebrate West Hartford, a portion of the proceeds or the road rates. We haven't had those in a really robust way for two years. So again, we lost a, a major funding source uh, for that fund. So this came at a great time for us. We anticipate that we'll be able to use this for up to four years. Um, we also have some other ideas about ways to use this um, scholarship fund, and I don't know if you want to hear about it now or you want to wait until we've kind of gotten them more fleshed out. Well, we're on it. Why don't we hear about it? So one of our ideas that I floated this past Matt the other day is that um, we would really like to use this fund to offer free um, lifeguard training to residents who are um, in financial need. Um, and we particularly want to encourage um, some of our leadership from the teen center or from the Hannock community to take advantages of this opportunity for lifeguard training and then um, with a pledge that they would work for the department for, um, you know, like two years. Um, so this would help us diversify our workforce. It would help us provide job training um, and it would help us to um, to really help our community help itself. That's, a, that's an excellent idea. So we're working with um, we're working with uh, the team that's at Health Fitness, along with Mark Blanchard, the manager and Suzanne Oslander, who oversees the Hannock community. Uh, center. That's great. That's fantastic. That's an excellent idea. Um, so, well, again, so last thing I wanted to go over. So, how does like a how does a family um, go about this process? Can you kind of walk us through that? I can. So, um, I'm just pulling up the 
program information, which of course is in Spanish. Um, so basically, a um, the first thing you have to do is create a a profile on RecDesk. We use um, that is our um, online portal to register for camps. So first, a family has to uh, create a profile on RecDesk. Then they need to come to um, Community Services, Suzanne Oslander's team, and have their income verified. Many families have already done this. They already have a RecDesk account. They need to get um, certified um, for eligibility. And then they have to look through the program guide um, and pick the um, their number one, two, or three uh, programs that they're very interested in. And then they come to leisure services um, and they make an appointment because this has to be done in person. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to honor a scholarship fund online. So it has to be done um, you know, in person with leisure services. And we've been, um, as I said, very successful. We've done this now uh, almost 50 times. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to go through the program uh, to, to get somebody fully registered. Um, uh, but they, we register them and then they have to pay at that time for their 25% of the, the fee. And it's been, you know, we've, it's been busy. We, we spent a lot of time in, in June, May and in, mostly in June and July doing this, um, doing these registrations. Can, can I ask why, why do we have the in-person interview for this? I mean, I don't think we do in-person interviewing for free and reduced lunch at the school. So our law, our online portal doesn't have an option for a scholarship and the scholarship is contingent on the verification. So they have a form that is, uh, you don't have to do in person to have your income verified. They've been doing that over the phone and they can email back and forth um, forms. But in order to do the program to register, it has to be done in person. Um, but we have staff to handle that. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at more of a, from, from a, a, a per parental, Standpoint one, it's a little humbling uh, to admit that you you, you will to go through that pro program. I, I would imagine, and and two, uh, you know, it just seems like a, a, another a, a barrier for someone who is clearly trying to do the right thing for their child. And maybe it's something that we might want to think about of finding a different way of doing that. Whether we can do this like a, a phone call. Um, or, or something along that line that doesn't require someone to come in between, you know, the, those hours of the day to come in and verify that. I think that there's different ways we do that. Um, you know, I know that the school district uh, obviously does doesn't verify um, in person for free and reduced lunch. Um, I, I think maybe we should look at potentially adopting something a little bit more. Um, Particularly in this stage, where I mean, look, we're having a committee meeting. We're not in person. Um, might be something that we look at. I, I understand that the, the the portal doesn't have that. Maybe it's something that we ask them to look into, or it's um, something that we run separately. Um, and, and you can advise on Rec Desk if you are looking for a scholarship. You know, please email da 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 da, um, and we, we kind of handle it that way. Um, we'd be happy. Sorry, this is Helen Rubino Turco again. We'd be happy to look at at some of those options. This was, you know, the first year. Um, uh, this was uh, obviously happened in June, so it was very late in the in the registration season. But that's something that we can certainly add to our uh, wrap up in um, in September and discuss with our. Um, online system with RecDesk. Um, and we can also look at other ways, per perhaps these virtual meetings. Um, again, that would require them to have a computer with, um, you know, the, the that capability, but we can certainly look at those uh, those options. We'd be happy to. Thank you for suggesting that. Um, uh, I, Council, Council Gold. Yes, th thank you, uh, Liam. I, I agree with you. Sorry, number one, sorry, I was a little late. I had a, a, a client appointment in the office that ran over, so. Uh, but I do agree with you, uh, Liam, in, in, in that way of, of application. I think that's important uh, just to have that sensitivity. 
Um, just relative to the lifeguard training, I just had a question. Uh, if we're offering that type of scholarship, that type of opportunity, which is amazing and it's a great concept, uh, is there going to be some limit as to where that individual would be required to work after training if somebody would be staying in town as opposed to yep. seeking a job outside of town after we've trained? Yes. Councilor Gold, uh, Helen uh, noted that the, the the requirement would be that they serve or work for two years in town uh, after okay. receiving said scholarship. And I, I, I missed that, so but thank you for the clarification. Thank you. No, no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, I, again, Helen, that is a, I love that idea. I think that's a fantastic um, idea. You know, I would think, you know, maybe even potentially uh, looking at expanding that to other um, uh, town uh, jobs that we offer to, to teenagers. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head, but obviously, I think like recruiting, um, uh, you know, counselors and things of that nature, or other uh, kind of, um, I think, more skilled positions, kind of like a lifeguard. Um, go, go ahead, Helen. So again, this is a concept that we're still building. Um, but I also have an idea to offer something like this also to seniors so that we, we have some very active seniors that may want to get lifeguard certification and might want to work at our outdoor pools. So again, um, th those are just some of the ideas that we're, we're exploring. Um, it, this, the training is so specific and it has a very fixed cost. So lifeguard training is something that's really tangible and has a, has a life skill value. Um, we don't have training for counselors. We have, you know, we just hire them, but um, certainly we continue to um, recruit our counselors through our, our public, largely through our public schools. Um, and we have, um, we do a, f a fairly good job with uh, recruiting um, for the and, and in including diverse recruiting um, in our counselors already. But we're um, we're excited about the 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 chance to to try this out. Yeah, no, it's an excellent job. I I, I was one, uh, Councillor Gold. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mayor. I, if you. I already spoke, so if you wanted to speak before me, I'd be happy to. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment. Thank you. Uh, I had been working with uh, Kristen Gorski about a kind of a mentoring ship, and I spoke with uh, Mr. Hart about this before. I've already met with uh, Chris Conway uh, and Kristen and a couple of Chris's associates uh, to set up some sort of uh, almost internship, a young entrepreneur type of uh, concept that the town uh, could be at the forefront of and kind of commingle from other towns. Maybe this is and, and kind of targeting younger uh, adults, younger people. Uh, maybe there might be some some way to work in conjunction as Liam is expanding this idea beyond lifeguards. Maybe there's an opportunity to kind of uh, uh, work uh, with other departments just so that we're we're not in individual bubbles here. But maybe there's an opportunity there to, to even expand it beyond uh, into that type of uh, young entrepreneurship uh, where we're we're helping to cultivate younger people. Uh, to work in town, stay in town, and be effective in town. Yeah, I, I think those, that's an excellent idea, uh, Councillor. Um, I think I think for what Helen's pull, pulling from here would be the scholarship fund to help them use the scholarship fund for that. I think what you're talking about is is a excellent idea and something that we should certainly be doing, uh, particularly in this kind of new uh, economy that we're working in, where um, you know, getting kids, uh, the, the, the real life experience, uh, and it'll also help. I know this is a big thing for the mayor is, you know, retaining, uh, retaining talent here in Connecticut. I know it's a big issue, obviously with her, her other job that she has, but I think that, um, Connecticut has consistently been tops of the brain drain. Uh, and if there's a way that we can connect them with our local uh, economy and get them experience here, they're more likely to, to stay here. So that's an excellent, excellent idea. Uh, Mayor Cantor, uh, your hand. Yeah, so I, I completely agree. And I think the Mayor's Youth Council, I'm sure, will have some wonderful input into what 
would work for them. We can, and uh, Lee Gold's son is one of the members. Uh, so I'm excited to, to help have them help form what we do, because I think it's important to hear their interest and not just have the idea in our heads of what we think will work and attract them, but what they also are interested in and, and how they can uh, participate. And, and uh, so we, there have been um, mentorship programs uh, that have been regional. I'm trying to remember the, um, the name of, uh, and I've been on tours and they've been very successful. So uh, we can either build on that, start our own or, or figure out, um, you know, what, what will work uh, for these youths and interest them and and really um, engage them and and uh, so I I'm I'm excited to have their input. I think it'll be important. Um, all right. Um, well, Helen, thank you for that um, background. Um, you know, I I would love to continue to think of ways to um, improve on the on the application process. Um, but I'm really commend you on thinking outside the box and how to better utilize that scholarship program. That's 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 excellent and um, really glad that we're we're moving in that direction. Um, it's a, a good move forward into your just general update. So if you want to take it from there, certainly. Um, thank you again, Helen Rubino Turco. So uh, just to finish up with the ARPA programs, I wanted to give you an update on. Um, a couple of other areas that we uh, we funded. One was the Fun Fridays that was held at uh, the skating rink. Um, they were really successful. One night had almost 100 people there. Um, and again, this had a component. There was a program within a program, um, and that was where we bused children from Hannock to the rink, um, fed them dinner, and then they also got um, this skates, uh, and we we actually gave them a brief um, skating lesson prior to having the rest of the community arrive um, and do the the Friday night uh, DJ skate. So it was really successful. We did three of them. We decided to hold off and do the fourth one in the fall. And this is again really targets um, middle school students. This is free to everyone. Um, we just had that little. Um, play within a play, if you will, the program that was for Hannock um, that was in addition to it. Um, the fourth one will be held um, on September 17th, and it's really called an icebreaker, and it's for a middle school students when they've just gone back to school um, and they go to the ring for this Friday night, you know, a free, a free Friday night event. Um, the library also uh, collaborated with us, um, and they organized two concerts that Carol made sorry if I'm stealing your thunder, Carol, um, but they were held at the showmobile in in uh, Eisenhower Park. We had it up um, for two different weeks to do outdoor programming. Um, they had 175 at their first one, 125 at their second concert. It was really well received. We also used this funding to help support the Summer Arts Festival. Um, we had thought that the Arts Festival would have to be held outside, but because of the changing COVID landscape, we were able to have it indoors, um, but have it be um, with social distancing. They had over 70 participants um, for Mama Mia, which this year had a little bit of a twist to it. Um, they had four sold out shows with 400 each. So it was very well received, lots of great um, uh, reviews. Um, moving on to our capital improvement update. The main thing we wanna talk about here is Eisenhower Pool. Um, and this will require some action for you at some point in the future. Um, this is our oldest pool. It was built in the late 60s, um, but it sat unused for 22 months um, and it really suffered uh, damage to um, a filtration system, drainage pipes, the, the storage tank. Um, the condition of the bathhouse has also been in, in bad shape. It's very poor now. Um, and we've got an estimate for the uh, replacement cost at about 2.45 million. And we would like to fast track this. Um, so this would require at some point um, this fall. Um, I know Matt Hart, the town manager, has um, some plans to amend our capital improvement plan and to shift some programs around and their funding sources. Um, but this will be part of that plan. So we hope that if the timing works out, 
that with this project being fast tracked that we would be able to select a designer and have that built uh, designed this um, by by Christmas um, and then bid and hopefully um, begin construction um, next year so that the pool will be able to reopen in the in the summer of 2023. Um, we, it had been in our capital improvement plan. We kept pushing it forward, thinking that we could continue to band aid that. But what we didn't anticipate was the damage that sitting si sitting unused for for almost 2 years, um, you know, had the effect that that had. Um, we also have some other projects that are either underway or about to start the King Philip baseball fields uh, improvements are underway. We're expanding the irrigation system there. We're building a new mound, et cetera. Um, the Walcott Park Western parking lot is um, slated. I forgot to put that into my notes. It's slated to begin August 23rd. Um, it'll probably take about six weeks, so we hope it'll be finished by October 1st. Um, and then the sand volleyball was approved by the um, planning and zoning in July. Um, we did reach out to a couple of different vendors and they said that the, the pipeline for um, supplies was um, difficult right now and they hoped that that would clear up this fall. So we're anticipating that we'll be able to put that out to bid um, probably this fall winter and then have that be a spring project. Um, moving on to our registration for fall programs has begun. Um, it's It started yesterday at noon um, and everyone can go to uh, westharvardct.gov slash leisure services. You can find the leisure services program guide there. It's a flippable document. Um, and you can uh, do your registration online uh, right now. Um, we are not printing our brochure this year and mailing it to every household. This is something that we did last fall as well. Um, we, it allows us to update and pivot quickly. Everyone, we really found that everyone um, did use it online um, and did find that um, they liked the convenience of being able to, to have it um, on their phones or on their computers. However, we do uh, have printed um, a couple of thousand copies. So they are available at town facilities, leisure facilities, including the, and then of course the libraries. Um, and we'll also give um, some copies to each public school to have so that in case people want to browse through it in a, the traditional way they can. Um, and very quickly, there's some upcoming news and events um, about our pools will close August 22nd. Beachland will remain open a little bit longer because of the pooch plunge. Um, we, we Well, not because of the pooch plunge, but we wanted to keep one pool open longer into the season to give more opportunity for people to, to utilize our facilities. Um, and that's where the pooch plunge will be on, on Monday, August 30th. Um, I just wanted to remind people also that Veterans Rink is going to be closed from August 21st to September 6th. This is, we close it not every year, but most years. Uh, we try to close it for a couple of weeks to do some deep cleaning as well as to melt the ice and clean the, um, and repaint the ice. Um, we also have um, two events by outside vendors or outside nonprofit partners. Center Streets is Sunday, August 29th, and the Garden Tours September 11th. Feast on the Farm is September 24th. More information will be forthcoming. Um, and social services very quickly. I have two short, two or three short updates. We did hold a regional panhandling roundtable discussion that I organized on July 14th. Over 20 representatives from a variety of stakeholders, including police departments, social services departments, um, community court, um, and our partners in the nonprofit um, arena, um, all joined together to um, talk about panhandling and about uh, poverty in general. Um, we discussed ordinances, signage, community education, and then also direct social services. Um, uh, social services to the people were discussed and Krog agreed to host to take this on as a as a subject and they will host a continued roundtable meeting that has been scheduled for November 9th. We have a couple of um, new staff and we're also really watching the um, eviction um, situation. It remains, you know, our concern is remains high, but we are directing people to the Unite CT program, which we've hosted the bus um, the van, the CT van, uh, C Unite CT van. Um, 
and I, I did want to mention, um, um, Mr. Sweeney, that you had asked for an update on federal funding. So I wanted to very quickly tell you that um, we, we receive community development block grants, as you know, and I'm sorry if I'm going quickly, I just want to try and give Carol some time too. Um, we also received um, CDBG COVID funds or CV funds. And that federal funding um, for CV specifically was split into two categories in West Hartford. One is for urgent need, and that sort of wound up around July 1st. Um, and then the other one is just in general to support low and moderate income individuals and neighborhoods. So um, under the urgent need area was like the ARCH program, which was the vaccination program for um, homebound people. We also had the vaccination line and then all of our vaccination programs to um, that we did all over town, whether it was in a low mod neighborhood or at town hall or at other locations. So that was all covered um, as portions of the vaccination program were eligible and we were able to fund that with the CV funds. Um, one thing that will come to to your um, to the town council as an action item is that um, one of those projects came under budget and another came over budget. So we will have to do a resolution to um, rearrange the um, allocation of the CV funding that you had approved because um, things changed as we you know things were m moving quickly when we when we did that, and we'll also have to do. Um, an amendment to HUD to tell them that we um, have rearranged the funding. It's not a, a significant thing, but it will have to come to the town council. So we'll have that ready for you um, at your first meeting in September. We'll review the resolution with you um, prior. Um, CDBG um, also covers paving in low mod neighborhoods that's underway. Oh, Helen, uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Council Wintergrad had a question. Sorry. I apologize. Yeah, uh, back for about ten minutes. So I I, 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 yeah, I, I see the report you did. Um, uh, the um, Eisenhower pool. So um, I mean, I see the you know that it was empty for you know the uh, unused for twenty two months. But um, can I hear more about that? I mean, why was it? What well, I mean, we know it was on the list anyway. But what happened that it wasn't secured properly? I mean, obviously. It doesn't get used every winter. So, I mean, we're used to shutting down. Um, I'm a little concerned about, you know, what what happened in that period that would have caused such damage. Thank you for that question, uh, Mr. Winograd. This is Helen Rubino Turco. Um, so, when they went to fill the pool, it was leaking, it was leaking badly. And we even had a diver go down and try to see where the leaks were coming from but it's it was systemic it wasn't just like one pipe failed or um you know one crack could have been filled um so this was our oldest pool um many back then many of the pipes were clay um and over time especially so when the water's in the pool it helps to s stabilize it but when there's no pressure to stabilize those things the frost can cause heaving um and I believe that that's also was a factor because there was no water in the pool for two years. Uh, when you put water back in and the ground had shifted um, significantly, um, that was um, a factor. So I think that this was destined to happen at some point. Um, I think that having it sit unused was accelerated the issue, um, but we, we had experts go, I mean, we, we tried to band-aid it. We were like, could we possibly try and get it through this summer? And it just wasn't, wasn't holding the water. But our engineers are saying that <clears throat> obviously, you know, the, the frost heaves happen every year um, when it's empty. I mean, we're engineers are saying that we should, I mean, I think we should have made a safety issue to put water in. No, no. Closed. I mean, do we know that it was caused by the gap or just the fact that we discovered it? Because, you, you know, I mean, we don't, I mean, are they telling us that it was caused by the extra gap or are they saying, or just we didn't know about it because it was not used for a while? And and part, part of the reason I'm asking, I mean, one, I'm concerned that we're, you know, I want to make sure we're taking care of our facilities properly, but also if it was caused by a long gap um, possibility of other funding, uh, it was just a, a shutdown related uh, damage. 
So those are great questions. Again, this is Helen Rubino Turco. It's my understanding that, you know, some of our newer pools could have withstood that and did withstand that. Um, but the infrastructure was much older at, um, at Eisenhower. Um, so I think that it's a combination of the age of the facility as well as accelerated damage that perhaps happened because it was left unused. Now, Mr. I, Mr. Chairman, Matt Hart, if I could <laughs> add on to that briefly. So thank you. Again, Matt Hart, town manager, just to add to Ms. Rubino Turco to Helen's explanation. Again, we did have the replacement of Eisenhower pool and the bathhouse in the capital plan just a couple years down the road. We've been trying to do roughly 1 pool at a time. And uh, I think just the conditions we've experienced. Over the past couple of years, you know, we. Obviously didn't envision having to keep the pool closed last year. Just uh, acceler accelerated things, but we can. Adjust the capital plan. Uh, to move this project up, we're already um, preparing our bid documents for design, which would lead to construction, et cetera. So we will look to get this done as uh, soon as we can and move it up, move it up in the project schedule. Yeah, that's great. I, 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 you know, uh, I think a lot of us on the council were, as I'm sure the staff was, was, was kind of surprised by what happened here. Um, you know, and in any in any way that we can to expedite this process, I think um, we would we would. You know, I don't want to speak for other members of the council. But I'll speak for myself. I think we would we we would I would be very supportive of anything that needs to be done to expedite um, uh, this construction of of a new pool. Um, that was a, one of the places that I was able to work at. Um, when I worked for the town, I know that there's a ton of people that utilize um, that, you know, that pool um, it takes, you know, it helps a lot of people on the, on the you know, very uh, north side of town. Um, and I think that that is very important that we get that, that taken care of. So, um, in any way we can be helpful, please let us know, uh, Mr. Hart and Mrs. Rubina Turco. Um, um, I, I just wanted to. Chime in on the 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 Krog piece that you mentioned, Helen. Um, in, in the future, can you just let us know about those types of gatherings that you're having? Uh, that's the first that I've heard of it. Um, it's been obviously an issue that uh, you know. I think everyone on the council has heard from some uh, member of the public about. It would be great to just be looped in on on that, and if you can send us that information about the the Krog event, that would be um, uh, fantastic as well. Um, and then, uh, thank you for the update on the capital projects. Um, excited to see some of these things come, come into play. Um, and, uh, uh, I don't know if anyone else had any. Questions on this section before we move to Carol and the library update. And before I start the, the, the library update, I want to thank Carol for putting together a really awesome uh, event with a library with one of uh, a, a fellow classmate of mine at Hall High School, Paul Kendrick. I think some of the council saw I presented his book that he um, published with his father. Um, for some of you who've been here in town, Paul Kendrick's father. Uh, was once the minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church on Fern Street, uh, and then he moved off to, to bigger pastures in Boston, but I believe that they're returning to, to West Hartford soon. Um, but they published a great day, a great book about Martin, Martin Luther King's final days, um, and it's been really well reviewed. Paul's been on all types of different uh, 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 TV and uh, uh, Web and, and other social media channels about uh, the book, and I just want to say thank you, Carol, for for making that available to the to the residents. I think it was a really good event. Are you ready for me to speak now? 
Thank you, Carol Waxman, Interim Library Director. I am very happy to tell you that all of our libraries will be back to near pre-COVID hours after Labor Day, which includes evenings at all buildings and full Saturdays at Noah Webster, Saturdays till two o'clock at the branches. In compliance with the Town of West Hartford mask mandates, all staff as well as visitors over the age of two must wear a mask at all times in all library buildings. Library programming will continue as remote or outdoors through the fall until conditions are safe for us to all return to in-person programming. All of our workforce has returned and we have hired new part-time people for our increased hours. We've been working on a few very important projects that are all to be completed either at the end of the summer or in the fall. One is a new tech lab. A West Hartford Public Library Kilfoyle funding request in the amount of $32,000 has been approved to build a new tech lab at the Noah Webster Library. We have been meeting to discuss future plans for the space that was formerly the computer lab. Prior to COVID, any of the public needing to use a computer all sat together closely in the computer lab. We all know that that is not possible now with social distancing, but even after COVID, we've learned that people don't want to sit exactly next to each other. They want space when they're doing their work. So the all public computers have now been spaced out on the adult floor to accommodate social distancing and patron privacy. So the space that was formerly the computer lab will now be a new tech lab and it will offer dual uses. We will offer the ability to produce podcasts. Um, people can use a Cricut fabrication device where they cut different objects and make uh, like a makerspace situation, an AutoCAD for drafting, video production, studio equipment, editing tools and software, and a station for digitizing analog content. In addition to allowing patrons to work with technology, the plan is to allocate the tech lab to offer additional instructional space, to offer classes and tutorials in technology, and provide additional study or meeting space within the library building. A door has been installed in the entrance to allow for privacy and quiet. A curtain is being installed so that we can segment the space. Green screen paint is being added so that we can produce videos. Equipment and furnishings are now on order, and it is hoped that the lab will be fully constructed and ready for use in October. Present staff will be in the lab to offer instruction, and we're looking into the option of hiring, of allowing an intern from a college to also help. The Bishop's Corner Library in a few weeks will receive their smart lockers. This system of an Element 4 Tower 21 locker system will be install, installed outside of the Bishop's Corner branch so that patrons can choose to pick up their materials at their convenience outside of open library hours. And this system was funded by, again, by a Kilfoyle grant. For instance, somebody who is elderly and cannot walk to the library has a son who might be able to pick up their items on a Sunday morning when the library is closed, that son can go right up to a locker, scan a library card, open the locker, and get the materials. Also, people who are using the Route 44 corridor use the Bishop's Corner Library very frequently to pick up materials and can come on Saturday night, anytime on Sunday, at night after 8, 6 o'clock in the morning, whatever is convenient for them. We're very excited about the opportunity to offer the smart lockers. And, and are confident that it will be well received by all of our patrons. We have installed a plaque on the adult level of the Noah Webster Library to display the former directors of the West Hartford Library with space for future directors. It was about time that we noted this for everybody who asks who were the former directors, how long did directors serve, so you can 
come and view this plaque now. It is installed. We had a study done about noise levels at the Noah Webster Library, particularly in the adult area, where the ceilings are extremely high and the noise is just too much. We had college students study the area and they made suggestions. We've started to take action on these suggestions. And the first phase of the acoustic panel project is now complete. We have had panels installed in the gallery area of the adult floor. A sound light acoustic wall panel system totaling 565 square feet of coverage has been installed to mitigate the noise levels and offer quieter spaces for those using computers and studying. A study pod has been purchased with American Rescue Plan Act for libraries funding in the amount of $24,250. An additional, additional Kilfoyle grant of $8,000 has been applied to that. The study pod is ordered and is expected in a few weeks. This is a modular meeting room that will be installed on site. It is a four-sided structure with a louvered roof that is ADA compliant and offers a private study space for one person or up to four persons by reservation. There are two glass sides and two fabric sides. The structure fits the need for patrons to be in an enclosed space within a public building for many reasons. Pre-COVID, we received requests, where can I study where it's completely quiet, where I'm alone? And post-COVID, where can I be in the busy library building without being near others? So this study pod will hopefully fit the needs for all people. It fits a table and four chairs, and these have been ordered. We're very excited to offer this option for our patrons. The library board and library foundation, as well as all library staff support the move for the Faxon Branch Library to the new community center and look forward to being involved in the planning and outreach to community stakeholders. We are very happy to tell you that we have resumed homebound service for those living alone in their own homes or those living in assisted livings, nursing homes, and the like. This service resumed on July 27th. Volunteers deliver library materials free of charge to West Hartford residents who are temporarily or permanently confined because of illness, disability, or advanced age. Our book sale is now operating again as pre-COVID, and donations for the book sale are being accepted at all library buildings. We hope to resume the long-paused notary public services at the Noah Webster Library in the fall, as well as offer professional counseling with resume writing, and business startup planning. As Helen mentioned, the mobile food share van continues to visit the Elmwood neighborhood parking in the Faxon parking lot. There are about 55 people who visit the food share van when it is there. The Faxon library is a distribution point for food bags that are donated by the Fern Street Universalist Church. There are 25 bags of food given out each week. And the Mayor's Youth Council has chosen 11 candidates and five alternates in grades nine through 12 from public and private schools in West Hartford. Meetings will begin in September and occur monthly. We will listen to the members of the Mayor's Youth Council to, de to determine what action projects they want to complete. What are they interested in? What do they think the community will need? And also how they will interact with the town council. We have been very happy to know that the Faxon Branch Library will be the proud recipient of proceeds from the auction of a bear from the Bear Fair project. That bear will be painted by Corey Payne, the artist of the Martin Luther King mural that we proudly showcase on the library building. Library patrons of all ages have experienced a robust schedule of programming this summer. 
Adult programming continues to be remote. 369 people have participated so far, far this summer in programs such as a New England road trip, music for the birds, and container gardening. Teen programs have been a combination of remote and in-person, with 129 attending and including Harry Potter birthday trivia, Minecraft meetups, and a virtual camp for girls in grades 8 through 12, meeting others from multiple towns in Hartford County and Springfield, Mass. Children's programs have been held all outdoors, with 391 attending in all three library buildings. They've experienced visits from zoo animals, hula hoop instruction, outdoor games, crafts, and story times. Children's programming will remain outdoors through the fall as weather permits until we are certain that COVID conditions are safe enough for us to return to normal programming. And that concludes my report. I am very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carol. Um, I, I, I have a, a couple of questions, um, more, more, more suggestions. Um, one, I would love to, if you, if uh, the, the the town manager or you could just advise up the council of when the youth council is meeting. Uh, I'd love to just be a fly on the wall and listen to what 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 they have to say. Um, I would love to hear hear about that. Um, um, additionally, um, uh, I wanted to see a thought crossed my mind when you were talking about uh, one. I'm looking forward to your podcast, Carol, when you get the get it all up and running. Uh, you know, I hope you and the the first interview is uh, the, Matt Hart uh, on your podcast. Um, but um, I'm interested to see. I know that you, most people have heard of master classes. Um, they're, you know, online um, instructional videos or not. They're more like very famous people giving you like the, their insight of how they did what they did very, very well. And it's like these multiple part series that, um, you know, you have to, you pay for a subscription for to the service for, which I think are very helpful. Um, I, you know, something I would love to see is if, if the library would look into if there's a way to get a subscription for the library, um, um, I think it'd be a really awesome opportunity to open up some doors for people that may not have access to it. Um, um, you know, there, you know, it's, it's kind of an expensive subscription. I don't really know um, what their broadcasting um, requirements are. Who they're, you know, some some of those things have some sort of uh, copyright uh, issues. I'm not sure if other libraries provide it, but I think it would be a really cool thing to maybe even reach out to the, the web, the company and see if there's a way to partner with them on this. Um, particularly with all of the really uh, innovative things that you guys are doing in regards to allowing people to kind of use libraries kind of workspace and, and, and developmental. Um, it'd be pretty cool to see that kind of come, come out and see what what could be done there? So just a just a thought to throw that out there. Um, uh, but uh, the, and, and again, what you guys are doing over there is fantastic. The last question I had when we last spoke, which was seems almost a, <laughs> six months ago, um, uh, one of the issues you guys had was the staffing. Are you guys having a better uh, that the less of an issue now? Yes, Mr. Sweeney, I'm very happy to report that we have had several recruitments. And we, we have a, several more and we find that there is a larger hiring pool now than six months ago. So we are being successful in hiring people and our staff is much more complete or complete as complete as we need it to be than it was. So I appreciate the question. And yes, we will definitely look into those classes, those videos. I'm actually going to have somebody who is going to handle this for the tech lab speak with you directly, if that would be okay, just to make sure that we're, we are offering everything that everybody is asking for. Sure, sure. Um, and and um, thank you for for your report, Carol. I um, I have uh, just a 
few things that I didn't put on the agenda that um, uh, I forgot to mention, and I kind of want to address them to, to Matt. Uh, Matt, obviously, with the and, and Ben, you know what? Uh, I'll let uh, uh, Councilor uh, Winning Red go. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councilor Sweeney. Uh, just a uh, question, Carol. I, I was at the library the other day um, and uh, observed a you know interaction uh, with a staff and um, a patron who was. Doing, uh, doing something wrong on a computer um, was spotted, um, you know, accessing something that he apparently shouldn't have been. Um, and uh, there was some dialogue back and forth and the, the patron sort of just left, <laughs> um, kind of ran out. Um, I, I just, um, and obviously at this point, you know, with the computers now being spread out, um, it was more, in, you know, more open area than previously. Um, so just, you know, two questions on that. I mean, one, you know, sort of what is the policy? I know it's been um, a longstanding you know, dispute among librarians as to, um, you know, the restrictions on on access to, to things. And again, I, I mean, I assume it was porn, but I have no idea. I mean, it, it, that wasn't stated, but, and apparently a the, the staff member made a comment about having tracked stuff previously. There was some tracking going on to determine, you know, what was being found. Um, so one is sort of what is our policy on that sort of thing? Um, and the other issue is just, do we have any tracking of those kinds of interactions? Um, sort of, is there um, incident report kind of thing that's required internally just to kind of get those things documented? Um, in case an issue comes up later. Yes, Mr. Winograd. Yes, if if it, if something that somebody is viewing is deemed offensive um, to anybody else or makes anybody else feel uncomfortable, the computer technician does address it immediately. I'm going to get a copy of that report to all of you, just for your your interest. And uh, Jen Francis, who is the head of our technology services, will be able to answer more fully. But it it happens rarely. But it does happen and needs to be addressed and is always addressed immediately because the computer technician can see what is being viewed on the computers. And we uh, and we take this very seriously. Incident reports are written. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because we have the name and the library card number of those using the computers. And what and are those policies? I mean, is it, uh, I mean, obviously you get, you know, sort of visual stuff. You also have, um, I mean, hate speech or whatever else are things that one might, you know, I mean, or uh, I mean, the various ways that something might be offensive. I'm just, how do we sort of deal with the first map right. issues as well in terms of who's just, <laughs> whose opinion after offensiveness? And is it, do we have, um, Filters, or I mean, you know, I'd like to hear a little bit more about sort of what our policy is on that. Yes, um, I would like to review the policy okay. and speak. And uh, before I speak to that, I know, of course, in the children's department, we do have filters, okay. but not so much in the adult department. But I want to review all of that before I speak again to you or have Jen Francis speak with you. Fair enough. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's always an important mm -hmm. question, and we are aware of it on top of it and and want it to be the best for everybody else here thank you uh thank you carol thank you council Winograd. um uh if you don't have any other questions i just have some questions for uh mr hart um start and, and i guess it's also probably for helen um and we're with we, obviously the recent spikes uh with going on with covid I know the town is obviously considering other measures that it can take. Um, what, where do things stand currently with regards to our, I haven't seen the latest report, but our vaccination rate in town. And then um, is there going to be, are there uh, new efforts uh, take, being taken by the health district to, um, to kind of step that up uh, 
in, in, in the kind of the corners of the state that aren't getting vaccinated to try to, to, to deal with this issue? I'm, I'm assuming yes, um, but we would like to know what, what's being done, done in our uh, little corner of the state. Matt Hart, Mr. town Mr. manager. Uh, thank, thank you for a good question, Councillor Sweeney. So West Hartford's vaccination rate is very strong uh, compared to other communities around the state. We're at 72, 73%, and that includes everyone who's, uh, who's eligible. Bloomfield is a little bit lower, uh, about 10 points below, 62, 63%. The health district has continued to um, uh, offer shots to anyone uh, on demand uh, throughout. They are preparing for a booster campaign this fall that they would plan to run in a similar fashion to the flu shot clinics that we've been doing for many, many years now. And, you know, we'll engage in a publicity effort as soon as we get the go ahead on that as we did last year. And, you know, as, as needed, I would think we would reestablish the ARCH program and the other support mechanisms we had in place just to ensure that everyone who wants the vaccine uh, and who's eligible to receive the booster will have access to it. I'm sorry, I had uh, people leaving my house. Uh, can you tell me the, the percentage number in town again? Yes, 72 to 73 percent for West Hartford and about 10 points lower for Bloomfield. Just because, uh, again, we're a two town health district, as you know, so we, we track both communities. And so we're, we're in, uh, and we're in just again, uh, where, where does this stand in regards to the rest of the state? Um, what is the, 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 the average? Uh, let's see, do I know that off the top of my head? I, I know that for a community with our demographics, it is a very high percentage. Uh, statewide, our numbers are pretty strong, as you know, because we have some smaller communities that are 85 to, uh, to 90 percent vaccinated. Um, I don't have, let me see if I can find the uh, statewide number okay. while we're talking. Don't, don't worry, I, I, I can probably find it uh, in the governor's uh, like daily email. I'll, I'll take a look at that. It's probably on the state's uh, COVID webpage. Um, I think Helen wanted okay. to add a point too. Go ahead, Helen. Thank you. Um, we do ha have um, some breakthroughs at, at our in our program, so I just wanted to make you aware. You know that we're not um, we're still very vigilant um, in keeping our children who are unvaccinated safe, as well as our our staff. But um, when we do have a breakthrough, we report it to um, the health district. We do contact tracing, and in some cases, um, people are. Um, have to quarantine and we give a full refund. Yeah, that's great. And it's, I mean, it's really effective. Um, and, and I know that you guys are doing a really good job at the camps in regards to making sure everyone's wearing masks. Um, um, all right, well, are there any like innovative, I think two questions, are there any ways that you guys are seeing Districts doing a, a really good job, or Ms. Allen's doing a good job of trying to target that unvaccinated uh, population. And then the the second is, um, you know, while one I say this, I said this to the the or my colleague on the council. We have a kind of a, a gift and the curse with a really thriving uh, downtown restaurant area and bar area. Um, that's also the place that you're going to have the highest level of likely of transmittal because of unmasking and the, the population that's going in and out of there. Have we have we seen or have we heard of any new updates from some of that the the kind of bar uh, restaurant scene downtown of uh, of significant issues or infections there? Matt Hard, town manager. Fortunately, no. Uh, at this point in time, the we're, we're not we're not seeing community spread as a result of uh, eating eating establishments. And in terms of your other question about innovative programs, I think it's it's similar to things that that we've conducted 
the door-to-door -door campaigns, uh, bilingual, using bilingual staff, you know, going door-to-door -door in uh, target target communities and encouraging them to uh, to come out to a small <laughs> pop-up clinic. You know, I think those are, we've seen some success here in West Hartford, as well as around the region, the state and, and the country with, with respect to those initiatives. We've also done things, as you know, uh, for specific employers, uh, targeting targeting grocery stores and other food establishments, and we've had some success there. But that's that's being very proactive, going out to the establishment, uh, knocking on the door, uh, coming up with a convenient, working with management to come up with a, a convenient time. So you know, I think we're gonna we're gonna continue to do that, at least over the next year. Okay. Well, um, appreciate you guys are doing excellent work, and uh, we appreciate the work that you're doing and, and all the consideration that's going into um, staying in front of this thing um, as it c continues to rear its ugly head uh, the last couple months. So, um, uh, Ben, unless you have anything, um, I'm just going to make a motion to adjourn and uh, thank you all, and I look forward to hearing back on some of the things that we discussed. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Liam has left the meeting.